Welcome to Hope for Today, a weekly Bible teaching program that will bring you hope for every day. Thank you for joining us this week as we continue our study through Exodus. As we are going through this section of Exodus, don't lose sight of the big picture. Some of these chapters are filled with lots of small details, and sometimes we wonder why all this information is in the Bible. If you start to feel that way, remember where this fits in God's story. God is building a kingdom, and he will redeem what was lost to sin. He will restore his kingdom in the whole world. I give you this short intro to remind you of the big picture. God's plan will be accomplished. He was working then, and he still is at work, despite how things appear. I thank you again for joining us here on Hope for Today. Let's go now with Bible teacher J. Mark for a closer look at today's lesson. One of the most beloved psalms of the Bible is Psalm 23. It begins, The Lord is my shepherd. In that psalm, David speaks of fellowship with God throughout the daily experiences of life. He finds God preparing a table for him, which speaks of nourishment and fellowship. A table signifies satisfaction, and it also signifies fellowship, a kind of oneness. The feasts of Israel are times of fellowship, usually around a meal. As you read the New Testament, you discover that Jesus often reclined with people around the table. The New Testament commands us, as believers today, to show hospitality to everyone, but especially to those who can't return the favor, that is, those who can't invite us in return. According to the predictions of the Bible, there is yet a great time of fellowship coming at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, in the experience of Israel, we see that in the place of meeting, the tabernacle, the Lord designed a table and he called it the table of fellowship. It's described for us in Exodus chapter 25 and verses 23 to 30. So let's learn about this table of fellowship. Follow along as I read Exodus chapter 25, verses 23 through 30. God is speaking to Moses. You shall also make a table of shatim or acacia wood, Two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And you shall overlay it with pure gold, and make a crown of gold round about it. And you shall make unto it a border of a hand breadth round about, and you shall make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. And you shall make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings in the four corners that are on the four feet thereof. Over against the border shall the rings be for places of the staves to carry the table. And you shall make the staves of shatim wood and overlay them with gold that the table may be carried with them. And you shall make the dishes thereof and the spoons thereof and covers thereof and bowls thereof to cover everything. Of pure gold you shall make them. And you shall set upon the table showbread before me always. In this text, we find certain directives for the construction of the table of fellowship. These directives should be helpful for us, too. The first directive God gave is the dimensions. God gave Moses the dimensions of this table, about one meter long, 39 inches, a half meter wide, 19 inches, and three-fourths of a meter, 29 inches high. So clearly, this was not a table for a large family. In fact, you could barely sit down to it yourself. So it was symbolic. It was a symbolic table of fellowship. And yet the dimensions of it were carefully prescribed by God, and he gave it to Moses. Now notice not only the size of the table, but the construction of it. It was made of acacia wood, very durable and light. And then it was to be overlaid with pure gold and to have a border of a hand breadth round about it. Also, it was to have a golden rim or lip around it. And so it was a small table, but it was decorated very luxuriously. Now, of course, there is no way the whole multitude of Israel could assemble around this table. 
and perhaps God never even intended for anyone to sit down to that table, and yet, to him, it was a table of fellowship. It wasn't large enough to accommodate any sizable group, but God said, it was a table of fellowship. And then God gave another directive, the design. And here we have the details. You shall make for it a border of a handbreadth, and you shall make for it four rings of gold, that the golden border may be around about, and the rings and the staves to carry it. And then he gave some additional particulars. There was to be a ring at each corner for carrying it, so that there was nothing permanent about the location of this table. It was designed to be movable. They were expected to carry it with them wherever they went. God wanted always to be in fellowship with them, and this table was a symbol of that fellowship. Among the people of Israel there were priests unto the Lord, and they had a distinct role to fill in using these furnishings in the tabernacle. And so the sons of Aaron, called Levites, were the ones who served at the table of fellowship. But every person among the children of Israel could have personal fellowship with God as well. And so, as I said earlier, this small table was designed to express fellowship. Today, the table of fellowship is the Lord's table, or Holy Communion, or the Lord's Supper. In that setting, we symbolically partake of the blood and body of the Lord Jesus, recognizing the fact that He is the one who makes us worthy to enter into God's presence and to have fellowship with Him. He is the living bread which came down from heaven, and by His Holy Spirit, you and I can have continual fellowship with Him. And then God gave a final directive, the dishes. While this was a beautiful table, and it was overlaid with gold, and it was well proportioned in size and shape, it wasn't there merely to look at. It had a purpose. It was to become a part of the services of the tabernacle. And so God told Moses to make dishes and spoons and bowls and lids to cover what was on the table. And they were to be made of solid, pure gold. No overlayment here, no mixture. In Exodus 37, 10-16, we can read how Bezalel built this table exactly as Moses instructed. This was the table of fellowship. And so the showbread was to be always on the table before the Lord. In Leviticus chapter 24, verses 5-9, to God gave the instructions how this bread was to be baked. Listen as God speaks through Moses. You shall take fine flour and bake twelve loaves from it. Two-tenths of an ephah shall be in each loaf, and you shall set them in two piles, six in a pile on the table of pure gold before the Lord. And you shall put pure frankincense on each pile, that it may go with the bread as a memorial portion, as a food offering to the Lord. Every Sabbath day Aaron shall arrange it before the Lord regularly. It is from the people of Israel as a covenant forever. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place, since it is for him a most holy portion out of the Lord's food offerings, a perpetual due. God expected this to be the table of fellowship, so they were instructed as to how they should prepare the bread and then who should eat it. But notice the bread was to be on the table for a whole week. So how did it not become stale or moldy? Evidently, it was matzah or unleavened bread. And you know something? These loaves weren't little either. They weren't small. Each one was made from two-tenths of an ephah. That's about four liters or a gallon. And Jewish sources tell us that each loaf weighed about five kilograms or 11 pounds. Now, what was the purpose of this bread besides the fact that it was to be part of the food supply for the priests? Well, in Scripture, it is sometimes referred to as the bread of the presence, or more correctly, the bread that is in front of. So there were twelve loaves, each loaf representing one of the tribes of Israel, and they were placed on two stacks of six loaves each on that table. And so every time a priest saw them, it most likely reminded him of several things. First of all, bread was the staff of life in ancient cultures. 
So this bread would have been a reminder that God was providing for the physical needs of his people. And then in addition, it was a reminder to God, if we can put it that way, of his responsibility to provide for his people. You and I both know that God doesn't need to be reminded, but it was visible there before him. Remember, God had promised that if his people would obey him, he would bless them with plenty of bread. And it also symbolized the fellowship that occurs when people eat together. Now, obviously, God was not right there with them eating this bread, but the priests were to eat it in his presence. So it was still a symbol of the fellowship that God wanted to have with his people. You know, God doesn't eat with you and me either at the Lord's table, but it is a symbol of the fellowship we have with him through Jesus, the living bread. By eating the bread that represents Jesus' broken body, we acknowledge our dependence on him and our gratefulness for what he has provided. Fellowship with God is vital. By these instructions and these plans, God was helping Israel to understand how vital that fellowship really is. For Israel, this fellowship was symbolized with a table and the showbread, the bread that was set out on the table. It was for them a table of fellowship, and surely it should have reminded them of God's daily care and the fact that the twelve tribes were continually represented there in the very presence of the Lord God. Today, you and I as believers have the presence of God living right within us in the person of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? That's awesome. We have the words of Jesus, the living bread to feed on in the scriptures. And through these, we can have continual fellowship with him, no matter where we are. This table of fellowship the children of Israel had went wherever they went, and God was present among them. His presence was real to Israel at Mount Sinai. Is his presence real to you? Are you eating at his table of fellowship? Thanks, J. Mark, for this teaching. And thank you for being here for this teaching. It is incredible to realize the Lord of the universe wants a relationship with people. He wants your heart. Way back here at Mount Sinai, God came close. Again, many years after this, God came closer. God came in the flesh and limited himself to a body. His desire was and is the same. He desires a relationship with you. He wants to be the object of your worship. After all, he alone is worthy. Today, we saw a small part of the story, and thankfully, Jesus has completed it. Through what Christ has done on the cross, we can come into the presence of our holy God and be in relationship with him. This is worth thinking about. If you'd like a copy of today's teaching, or if you'd like to contact us for any reason, here are a few ways you can reach us. The best way is through email. Our email is hope at heraldsofhope.org. If you don't have email, no problem. Just write to us. Our address is Hope for Today, Box 3, Breezewood, Pennsylvania, 15533. Or you can connect with us on our website. Our website is heraldsofhope.org. On our website, you will find some resources, and under the Listen tab, there is other teaching similar to what you just heard. If you go to the Connect tab, you can message us directly. Again, that website is heraldsofhope.org. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to being with you next week. Until then, go with God and grow in your connection with Him. He is an amazing God to love and serve.